For years, AMD was seen as the budget choice for gamers who were strapped for cash or just didn't want to spend as much money on a system, for the trade-off of a not insignificant performance hit. Even one of my friends back in high school, who was only casually familiar with computer hardware at the time, told me, quote, you get what you pay for with AMD, and their products are a hell of a lot cheaper than Intel. Now when he told me this, I initially started laughing because I didn't expect him to say that, and although he told me this over a year ago, I have to say that the arguments he presented to me were actually pretty solid assessments of the products available at the time. Now obviously we didn't go back and forth about scheduling, core architecture, or other high-level hardware features, but what he told me was that AMD just throws tons of weak threads at a computing task to essentially brute force the software to run at acceptable performance levels. And looking at Zen and Zen Plus based chips, I have to agree with him on the logic to an extent. However, with Zen 2, AMD did a massive course correction and re-engineered the Zen CPU core to offer both high single-threaded performance and high multi-threaded performance, in a package smaller than comparable chips available from Intel. And looking at the graphics department, they've made tons of improvements to their microarchitectures over the years, and it's brought AMD back stronger than it ever was before. Before I get into this video, I want to say that my YouTube analytics show that only 4.2% of my total viewership is subscribed to this channel. If you enjoy this video or any of my other videos and want to see more content, then subscribing is the fastest and easiest way to be notified when new videos are posted, and it also helps me to get hardware for videos. But I just wanted to bring that up, and with that out of the way, let's start talking about RDNA 2. So if you've been following AMD's graphics division, ever since the release of the RX 5700 family, details of the next generation RDNA 2 based GPUs have been circulating with varying degrees of accuracy. A lot of us are expecting this upcoming generation to be a huge step up from the current RDNA 1.0 based RX 5700 and 5700 XT with AMD bringing ray tracing capabilities, along with several other software-based performance-saving techniques into their official feature set. Now, what a lot of us find interesting, specifically about RDNA 2, is the support for DXRT without any hardware RT cores like what's found in NVIDIA's RTX 20 series. Instead, AMD is falling back on previous work by re-implementing Rapid Packed Math to allow for each stream processor to accelerate lower bit depth lighting in AI algorithms. This also plays into variable rate shading, but it's a little more complex. When rendering a game, you can use numbers of different specificities when running calculations for some sort of operation. When you make a number less specific, or in this case, precise, that means that you can use variables that take up less memory and computing resources. This is why FP32 and FP16 performance is often advertised using the classic FLOPS moniker. And the lower the amount of bits dedicated to storing a number in memory, the less precise it is, and the more the GPU is approximating positions of vertexes and intersections. Let's say I'm trying to render this triangle in DirectX 12 Ultimate. The three points on screen each represent a vertex of the triangle, and it's used by the GPU as a point, which is used as a starting and stopping point when drawing geometry and mapping textures. This is ultimately how scenes in video games are rendered, and these vertices are placed throughout the game world using a three-dimensional grid, usually using 32-bit floating point numbers. Now the problem with using floating point numbers with a lower precision is that the numbers are truncated, causing the precision of the drawn vertices to fall by a small margin. Let me do a little demonstration on what I mean. Okay, so to help visualize exactly what I'm talking about, I found a little 32-bit float. Uh, I don't even know what this would be called, but basically what it is is it's got 32 little boxes that we can check off uh, to set a specific digit to, for example, say we want to set this bit to 1. This is what that represents, so all these are zeros except for the little check mark, and you still have 32 bits stored in memory. So. Let's say we want to fill up all of these bits, all 32 of them. 
Also, uh, right down here, if you want to follow along with more of a visual representation, this is the, like it says here, the binary representation. So, this is literally the biggest number that you are able to represent for using a 32-bit float. So what you're doing is, since it's a 1, uh, hold on a second, yeah, so it's negative. So what you're doing is you're setting negative 1, you're doing negative 1 times 2 to the 128th power times this. Uh, that's what the value is. That's the highest number that you can physically represent using a 32-bit float. Say we want to do a 16-bit float, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. This is the highest number you can now uh, represent, which is negative 1 times 2 to the 128th still, uh, times 1.99, which is a little bit smaller uh, than if we were to just set them all to 1. Uh, or should I say, it's not smaller, if you see, it's literally shorter, uh, because we're only using 16 bits. Now if we want to, let's say, set all these to zero and make it 32 bits, suddenly it jumps to 32 digits. Now we are stuck with this. So if we set it to 8 bits, you can now see that the amount of data that you can represent is so incredibly small. It can only represent, basically, a whole number which is basically an integer uh, and then something in the tenths place which is you can't really use that for very much if you're using something for like I don't know a rasterization operation uh, if something is at let's say 1.7 1.07 you would literally not be able to represent that using an 8-bit float because there's literally not enough decimal places for you to be able to do that you want to bring it down to 4-bit uh, this is the largest, but really isn't any much, uh, any more useful. Go down to one bit. Only thing we can represent is a negative one or a positive one. So hopefully that helped to clear it up a little bit. So as you saw, when you shrink the amount of bits you're using to represent a number, the amount of data you're able to pull from it decreases thanks to the decreased precision. A way I personally like to think of it is like the resolution of either your monitor, TV, or frame buffer. And it's roughly analogous because as the resolution of your frame increases, the amount of detail that's able to be expressed by the screen is increasing. This is why 4K looks sharper than 1080p, and why 1080p looks better than 720p. Similarly with floating point numbers, when using higher resolution numbers, you're able to extrapolate more detail from a scene. Imagine trying to play a game at 720p on a 4K screen. It'll look super blurry, almost chunky, because the game isn't sending enough data to your screen to properly display the image at a native 3840 by 2160 And like resolution, when the precision gets too low, it becomes almost impossible for the rasterizer to properly draw geometry in an accurate manner. Instead of being able to draw a vertex at, let's say, 1.9975.8256 right and 6.782635 up using a 32-bit float, when reducing it to just 8 bits, you can only represent the points as 2.0 right and 6.8 up, which is heavily truncated from the values computed using the higher precision variable. Now, floating point numbers aren't just used for drawing and culling geometry. They're actually used for almost every rasterization operation, which includes lighting, shadowing, animations, sound, and especially ray tracing. Within an RDNA 2 stream processor, Rapid Packed Math allows for up to 64-bit floating point computations, and can go as low as 8-bit if the software allows. This means the chip supports FP8, FP16, FP32, and of course FP64 operations, variables, and pointers. Variable rate shading takes advantage of this by separating portions of screen space into chunks, and then reducing or increasing floating point precision based on visibility to the camera and player. Now, I don't have a Turing GPU to demonstrate this on, but here's a very simple approximation of what I was just explaining. Here's a 3840 by 2160 frame, and I divided it into chunks of 40,000 pixels, or 200 by 200 and then group these chunks together based on what precision I would render the game at if I were, let's say, a ProSU VRS engine. 
After grouping them together and then shading them in to show the specific regions I chose, you can see that the further you get from the center of the screen, the less precision the GPU is rendering at. Typically, the edges are where you see the least precision, but based on environmental detail present in a frame, the algorithm might choose a chunk in a dark shadow in the middle of the screen, let's say, and decide to only render the outline of the shadow using FP32, and then render the inside of it, which is obscured by the shadow, at a lower precision, which saves resources and memory. Obviously, I'm way oversimplifying, but the basic idea rings true with both NVIDIA's variable rate shading and AMD's upcoming revision of rapid-packed math. However, AMD is also using RPM to not only improve rasterization performance, but to accelerate DXRT by allowing the software to adjust the precision of rays cast into the environment based on the same parameters as vanilla RPM and VRS. It's a fascinating topic, and it really dives deep into the fundamentals of computer science and engineering. And if you're interested, I would implore you to check out AMD or NVIDIA's white pages discussing the feature, because you can get a lot of free knowledge from them if you know where to look. If you're an engineer like me, then you'd love to read them, and get deep into the tech to figure out what exactly is going on. So thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I know I just dumped a ton of information on you, but keep in mind that I'm not on the AMD or NVIDIA driver or engineering team, so I don't know or even have access to every single detail and line of code to break it down and show you how it works. Obviously, I can make comparisons like in this video, but it's not as in-depth of an explanation as you would need to fully implement and become fully aware of every single piece of minutia that goes into this. But it was a lot of fun talking. And if you want to learn more about computer hardware or software, then the annotations on screen are a great place to start. Thanks for spending your time with me, and thanks for watching.